Hello and welcome to a special guest episode of the History of the Germans. As you know, I'm still working on getting Season 9 to the starting blocks, and the good news is that we will kick off on October 3rd and we'll embark on a journey that will take us to the Council of Constance, the Hussite Wars, the emergence of Burgundy, and the rise of a completely new threat, the Ottoman Empire. So everything changes as we leave the Middle Ages behind. But even after that season, we'll still be a long way from the 20th century, and I know that many of you are really waiting for us to get into this period, in particular into the First World War. And one question I often get is, how did Germany manage to hold out for so long against the combined forces of Britain, France and Russia? But help is at hand. I have mentioned the Not So Quiet on the Western Front podcast before, and I must say, Dan Hill and Dr. Spencer Jones are doing an absolutely brilliant job at explaining the military history of the First World War. And they've just released the episode that deals with exactly this subject, and a few others besides. I've listened to the episode twice already and just find it incredibly illuminating, and I hope you will too. So, without further ado, here is Germany at War. Welcome to Not So Quiet on the Western Front, the podcast where we lift the lid, bust the myths and explore the incredible history of the First World War. I'm Dan Hill, a military historian and battlefield guide specialising in the history of the war on the Western Front. And I'm Dr Spencer Jones, author and senior lecturer in war studies at the University of Wolverhampton. In this episode, along with guest historian Professor Matthias Strohn, We'll take a long-awaited look at the story of the German army in the First World War. From those first vital days of 1914, through the gruelling battles of trench warfare and the massive assaults of 1918, we'll discuss just how the German army fought, adapted and sustained four years of combat on the Western Front. Oh, hello, Dan. Always a pleasure to be joining you and a special pleasure today to be joining a special guest who's joining us from our sister podcast, Both Sides of the Wire. It's already had an appearance on this podcast in our bonus episode where we combined our podcast, but it's a real pleasure to be joined by such an expert in the German army and indeed a a soldier or or an officer, I should say, of that army too. And that's Matthias Strohn. So, Matthias, welcome to the podcast. Well, hi, Spencer. Hi, Dan. Well, thank you very much for having me again on your podcast. Um, absolute delight. I keep listening to yours while trying to learn what I can steal from from your podcast for hours. So um, it's brilliant to be back. And brilliant to have you back as well, because we're going to be discussing, as we just said in the opening paragraph, this is of all the things, all the topics that get requested in our inbox. And thank you, listeners, if you've ever written in with a suggestion, we do read every single one of them. But if we were to rank them in a chart, put a little tick mark next to each one for the number of votes, the German army in the First World War has overwhelming number of votes. And really, we probably should have done this topic a little bit sooner, to be quite honest, Dan, but we've been waiting for this opportunity. Yeah, hi, Spence. Hi, uh, Matthias as well, of course. Uh, It's one of those, again... A little bit like I found with the Doughboys, it's such a daunting prospect of of really getting stuck into the story of the German army in the Great War. It's such an enormous part of the story, of course. We've looked almost exclusively from the Allied side of the Y throughout this entire series so far, and the opportunity has always been an intriguing one. But to be able to bring in an expert to help us uh, paper over the inevitable cracks when you and I take on a subject like this, Spence, is absolutely, uh, absolutely vital. So, I mean, I think the best way to go about this today is maybe just uh, answer a few of the really big top level questions about German army performance in the Great War, how it looked on the Western Front, how that evolved, as you said in the opening piece there, Spence. It's it's really interesting. So, I mean, I might just throw one at you, Matthias, just to start us off, actually, um, because, of course, we need to go back to 1914 and maybe just slightly before that to talk about the story of the army pre-war. How exactly, we we know the story from, at least in Western eyes, of the German army being huge, having some kind of residual military experience um, and being being numerically very strong. But what's the reality? Is it really as we see it in Western eyes? It probably isn't, to be perfectly honest. So when you look at the German army in 1914, first of all, um, unlike the British army, but like the French army, it's based on conscription. So that, of course, immediately gives you a lot of numbers. 
But when you look at how the Germans do conscription, they don't conscript everyone they could conscript. And there are a number of reasons for that. The first one is, as always, money. There isn't enough money in the German system to recruit everybody. There is also the hesitancy in the higher echelons of the military, because they don't really want to bring in lots of people from the cities, from the towns, uh, workers, because they think they're all infested with these ideas of socialism. You don't want to have these in the army. So what they prefer is uh, peasants that they can draft. And it's only about 50% of these people they could draft per year actually do get drafted. So when you look at the actual numbers, Germany is much larger than, than France in numbers, about 20 million more people in 1914. But the armies are pretty much the same, because the German army only... Uh, recruits about 50% of the people it could conscript. That is very, very different in France. So yes, you do have a relatively large military, but that's mainly because Germany is a very big country. And it's in 1912-1913 that uh, Ludendorff, who of course plays a very important role in the First World War, he more or less pushes through an enlargement, a reform in the army, which gives the army a few more army corps. Because everybody realizes that within the growing threats around Germany, whether that's France or whether that's Russia, um, the army wouldn't be big enough to fight successfully in a two-front war. So it's actually not as good as some people think. That's an interesting point, and one that I think for a British audience and a British English-speaking audience, imbuing perhaps in some ways the image that the German army projects of itself prior to the war, very military efficient, very formidable. It's interesting just from my research on the British army before World War I that there's there's definitely a core within the British army of officers and, and some politicians who really admire the German army and say, well, our army should be more like the Germans. And it's interesting the number of uh, smaller powers or rising powers like Japan who s sort of see Germany as the model to follow. And one thing that I think you've laid out some of its, not exactly limitations, but some elements of it that perhaps don't quite match the image. But what do you think are its strengths? What what really makes the German army the, the formidable force that ultimately it will prove in the, in the war? Well, the first thing that we need to say is when we talk about the German army, that doesn't exist. Because you have four different types of army or armies. So the big one there, of course, is the Prussian one. The second largest one is the Bavarian one. Then you've got to Württemberg and Saxony. These are during peacetime standalone armies. They're leaning towards Prussia, but they are independent. That in itself is quite interesting and tells you an awful lot about how Germany is organized at that particular time. When you look at the strength of the German army, well, first of all, it's the training. And the German army here, of course, has an advantage over, for example, the French and in particular the British, because the Germans know that when war breaks out, this is going to be a big war. This is going to be a continental major conflict. And this is the only war they really need to worry about, they really need to prepare for. So very different from, for example, the British army that needs to look at uh, colonial warfare, imperial policing, and then also do stuff potentially in Europe. The Germans don't have that. That means the training and also the equipment is very much geared towards this big war. And when you look, for example, at the equipment, what the Germans are very good at in 1914, that's particularly the artillery and heavy artillery. So they really have more guns and bigger guns than the other powers, in particular the, uh, the British. So that gives them an upper hand. And that's also an integral part of the German war plan in 1914, all the way through to 1916, the Battle of Verdun, we'll probably talk about that a little bit later. Uh, that is really there, and the Germans know that, that their artillery is good. There are also some weaknesses in there that we can also discuss. Uh, that's a really good point there you make, Matthias. I think the the, the general idea, actually, when we talk, you, you raised the, the point of planning there and German war plans. And, and as you rightly say, you know, it's only really a focus on that continental large scale combat, whereas the Brits particularly have got other things to consider. I'm um, just talking about the general idea of planning in 1914, even prior to that, because, of course, famously von Schlieffen doesn't live to see his plan enacted. But how would you rate that first 1914 staff planning? And in fact, how would you rate German general staff generally on the eve of war in 1914? I think here you need to distinguish. On the one hand, you've got the operational staff work. And I think that in the German army is very, very good because the Germans have a very strict, very efficient way of training and also educating the staff officers. 
So that works really, really well. They send people to the academies. Everyone basically thinks the same, which makes it possible to come to, to conclusions relatively quickly. There's a fundamental difference, I would argue, in particular to the British system. And the German system also, because it is concentrating on this continental European war, knows exactly what it needs to do. It's thinking in large formations. The British in particular, they don't. Spencer, you know this much more better than I do. Um, they, they fight different types of wars. That's what the Germans are really quite good at. So the underlying staff work behind that is very good. Sometimes also quite boring. So the unsung heroes of the German staff system 1914 are the guys from the, the transport unit or the transport branch of the, um, of the general staff because they come up with the mobilization plans. And that really is quite dull when you look at it. It must have been quite dull when they put it together, but absolutely essential. Because the Germans thought that while well, using, of course, German efficiency, they would be able to mobilize their armies faster than the enemy and then invade. And we'll come back to that uh, probably in, in a minute. When you look at the actual plan that they have, and you already mentioned the word, the Schlieffen plan. The plan that they set in motion in 1914 is an adapted version of the Schlieffen plan. So Schlieffen apparently on his deathbed said, well, uh, make sure that the right wing is strong. Um, his uh, successor in 1914, Molke, uh, he's watered it down and he's moved more troops to the left flank, basically protecting Alsace and Lorraine. Um, the idea behind that, from a pure military point of view, you can understand and it's relatively sound. You need to make sure that you defeat one enemy quickly. Up to uh, 1912, the Germans have two plans. One is the uh, uh, the plan against France. The other one is the plan against Russia. They then drop that, the one against Russia, because they say there's not much point in invading Russia. Napoleon has shown us this. You basically get lost in these, these vast areas of Russia, and you're going to be chasing the Russian army. You're not going to win. So the only real aim and chance that you have is to go west, defeat the French very quickly, and then see what happens. And the German war plan after this basically is not very specific. And it says, well, let's see what happens. Probably some sort of fight against, uh, against the Russians. The problem that you have, and that is one of the weaknesses of German military officers all the way up to 1945, is that they only think in military terms. So Schlieffen is given a military problem, how to defeat France. And he comes to a military solution. And that means going through Belgium, invading Belgium, and then, of course, the right hook going into France. Completely neglecting, uh, forgetting about, not paying attention to the political consequences. What does that mean, for example, for Britain? Because everyone knows Britain is going to come to the war. They don't look at this. And that really is one of the fundamental weaknesses that you find, not only in the First World War, but all the way up to 1945. That's just really interesting, and it's something that we've mentioned on the podcast, Dan and I, about this old saying, impossible to trace its origins. If you want to know about tactics, talk to the Germans. Uh, if you want to know about logistics, talk to the Americans. Want to know about strategy, talk to the British. And it's interesting that there's some criticism of British strategy, or, or rather lack of it. Britain calls a, an emergency meeting, actually, the day after the war's declared, and says, well, what are we going to do? What's our plan? You know, it looks quite amateur, but it's interesting that from that, a strategy that basically works for the First World War, blockade Germany, try and cut Germany off from trade, keep Britain's allies fighting, raise an army that hopefully is going to be powerful enough by about 1917, is basically created within 48 hours and then held through. So it's done in an amateurish fashion, but it's strategically quite a good vision. Whereas, as you, I think that's a great point that the Germans are trying to are facing a strategic problem and applying a military solution to it. It's that old saying: if all you've got is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. Um, but I have to say, it's a pretty big hammer that the Germans are wielding <laughs> yeah. in 1914. That that is very true. And of course, you also need to understand German military tradition in this. So you can go all the way back to perhaps Frederick the Great and the 18th century. The strategic situation for the Germans hasn't really changed. So what they need to do is they need to achieve a, a quick military solution to a political problem because they know that surrounded by enemies, they will not win a long war. So they really need to go in there, all guns blazing, and defeat the enemy like a boxer. So you need to make sure that you knock out your opponent in the first round. If the opponent is still standing in round nine, you've got a massive problem. And that's why they concentrate very much on that a military solution rather than looking at the bigger political stuff, which, of course, as we then know from 1914 onwards, is a problem. Because when the German war plan fails in 1914 after the Battle of the Marne, 
basically the Germans, you might argue, perhaps even have lost the war. And the Germans are quite clear. When you then look at uh, Molke's uh, successor, Falkenhayn, he says in late 1914, early 1915, Germany cannot win the war militarily alone. We need to come to a political solution. And that really puzzles everybody because nobody had thought about these political implications. So really, really quite confusing. Well, I, I like the fact that you've brought that up there, and we were certainly going to touch on it as we go through in terms of at what point is the war unwinnable for Germany? We'll maybe come back to that question shortly. But in order to get there, let's just have a quick look back at the uh, the early days of the fighting in terms of once the uh, adaptive Schlieffen plan is operated, the first sickle, big sickle cut comes in through... Uh, you know, through the Ardennes, eventually round into Belgium and France, of course, capturing huge swathes of territory in doing so. But the the analogy that Spence used on this podcast a number of times is putting a grit into the uh, into the engine of the German war machine by small yet important holding actions. We look at things like Liège and various episodes like that. Now we know, interestingly, that the Germans have got some real ace cards to play, such as the uh, the Krupp, very super heavy guns, which are going to effectively draw the teeth of the uh, of the national defense national redoubt system in belgium but at what point can you identify any specific points uh, matthias where you feel that the schlieffen plan starts to come unstuck or is it really doomed for failure from the start well if you look at the bigger strategic picture i personally would argue that the plan isn't sound in 1914 because this idea that you could defeat an army and its allies, so the French army plus its allies, in a campaign that lasts about six to eight weeks is uh, is just basically impossible. And if you go back to the last big war that the Germans had fought, 1870-71 against the French, that also lasts very, very long because that's the first time that you have, as they call it, a people's war. So once the uh, the old cabinet war, so to speak, is uh, is over, the the nation, the French nation, nation rises up and that really confuses the Germans. And the Germans know that this is going to happen again. So this whole idea of being able to defeat an entire nation in a few weeks is, is completely, complete nonsense. And in the German case, a lot of people actually knew this as well. So when you look at the German documents, uh, a lot of the senior officers are not quite sure whether they're actually going to defeat the French plus the British and the Belgians and, and then be able to turn against France. So there's, there's this grand strategic issue and problem that you have. That's the first one. When you look then at the operation execution of the plan. Well, I would personally say where you really have the problem is before you actually get to the Battle of the Marne. Because when you look at the original plan, the idea was that the German army or armies would swing around to the west of Paris and then crush the, in particular, the French army against the German forces standing in Alsace and Lorraine and further to the north. But they decide to go south to the east of Paris. And you can already see when this is happening that this whole idea of being able to completely annihilate annihilate the French and encircle them is probably going to fail. And you're going to go for a head-on battle, and that's exactly what happens at the Marne. Well, of course, the Marne is something that we have covered in previous episodes and is, uh, I think, much overlooked in British eyes, particularly because of a fairly limited involvement. But ultimately, we're going to see as a result of the Marne the settling down into a new phase of warfare, trench warfare, which I think there's maybe an argument here, Spence, um, at least from what we've discussed previously, to say that German performance in the early part of that that settling of trench warfare, and particularly going into early 1915, is very strong. I mean, we've looked previously at things like Orbers Ridge. We've looked at even offensive actions at Second Eep. Spence, what do you think in terms of the German performance in the early part of 1915 once this new style of warfare develops? It's an interesting point, and I'm going to very carefully dodge your question, Dan, and talk about it from an <laughs> allied perspective and throw it to Matthias, very conscious of uh, who the expert is on this podcast. I, I think there's a few factors here. One, you've got a change in the nature of warfare. You've got positional warfare, where certainly in 1914 and 15, as we've discussed, all the advantages lie with the defender. Listeners, if you listen to our early episodes and you weren't haunted by the idea that the British are sending infantry into the attack in 1914 against barbed wire trenches, carrying quite literally sackcloth that they're supposed to throw over the barbed wire and then climb over it using a sack, if you're not horrified by that amateurness, then you know you need to go back and re-listen to those episodes because the British and the French are not 
prepared for the level of defences they're facing. They don't have any experience facing a continuous front like this. It's Nobody here does. It's completely new. So the advantages lie with the defender. I think as well, the... Uh, the French army has suffered a horrendous year in 1914, enormous casualties, perhaps 300,000 dead and perhaps a million wounded. The worst the worst period of French military history in terms of raw casualties. The British army, very small and professional, it's really had its, its heart torn out. It's, by the end of 1914, it's suffered 95,000 casualties, tiny compared to the French, but in a small army, a really devastating blow. So the the allies the western allies are in a, a vulnerable position they are their armies have been really badly blooded they're fighting in a, a period of the war where all the advantages lie with the defender but to to turn this so that that's the sort of the background of the allies but the germans do seem to adapt very quickly even though there are advantages to defending in 1915 clear advantages the speed with which the Germans turn the Western Front into a fortress, which is going to inflict appalling casualties on the British and the French through 1915 onwards, is really quite remarkable because, of course, the German armies also suffered very heavy casualties in 1914. So, Matthias, how do they do it? What's the secret to why the Germans turn the Western Front into such an unbreachable fortress? Well, I think the first point is that, and you already made it, Spence, that, of course, the Germans lose an awful lot of men as well. And sometimes we overlook that. So 1914, 1915 are extremely bloody years for the German army as well. You then talked about the power of the defence, and that is absolutely right, because the, the Germans can choose the terrain. And that means that um, for most of the war, the Germans sit on the high ground with all the benefits that that brings. Also, the equipment that they have, coming back, for example, to artillery. Artillery, of course, can be used in an offensive, but also in a defensive role. And if you have more artillery than the enemy, that already gives you an upper hand. So these are some of the advantages. There is also one, I would argue, which takes us perhaps a little bit away from the pure military history. And when you look at German society at that particular time, you have, compared to most other nations, a more highly educated population. And in particular, that meant you had a very, very high number of engineers. And of course, you can use these to, to build defensive works as well. So there's another, another strong point of the, of the Germans. When you look at how the Germans fight and what the German military actually think about their own positions in 1914 and early 1950, they're actually not quite happy themselves because the order comes out that they should only prepare in late 1914 uh, rudimentary positions because the idea is that very, very soon the German army would be on the attack again. So if you dig in too deep, that takes away the offensive spirit. And the 13th Regiment from Münster, my hometown, when it builds the, the first trenches, it actually states in the regimental history that these trench positions were not chosen in accordance with the law of war because they're not in good positions, they're not on, on rearward positions, and they complain about this. But they've been ordered to dig in where they stood and where their offensive came to a halt. So again, it's, it's a bit of a mixed bag that you find here. But generally speaking, in particularly compared to the Allies, yes, they do have the upper hand. And from 1915 onwards, the German defensive system then becomes much more, much more systematic, much deeper, and uh, and much cleverer as they go along. And there are some changes in the doctrine as well that come out, and that's then incorporated in 1915. I just want to stick with the theme of 1915 for a minute, actually, because previously we've discussed this and we've talked about, of course, this, if you like, this evolutionary race that develops on the Western Front. But in British circles specifically, we're often as well in 1915 looking back at the home front and in particular looking at the rapid expansion of the BEF, building up more troops to eventually come out to the Western Front. We see our first two Kitchener divisions out by late 1915. We see territorials come out in much larger numbers. And of course, a, a huge expansion in terms of volunteerism and trying to get more people into the army. I'd be really interested if we throw conscription into the mix here and how the German system's very different. Can you give us an idea of actually what life is like behind the lines in terms of recruiting and volunteering and bringing up more numbers, which the Germans inevitably need to continue to fight this war? About 1915, back in Germany, what, what's that like? Well, by 1915, the number of volunteers has probably pretty much dried up. And so now, again, German efficiency comes into play and the, the whole machine of conscription and recruiting is really set in, in motion. And that works very well and quite efficiently. And what the Germans have up to 1915, really, um, is you might say a two-tier army. They've got 
what they don't call the regular army, but in inverted commas, the normal army. And then they have reserve formations. And these reserve formations um, consist predominantly of uh, reservists, it's in the name, and uh, they also have, for example, less artillery support. This all changes then from late 1915 onwards, early 1916, after all these divisions um, have suffered so many casualties that these, these differences basically get watered down. But in 1914, 1915, you still see that. So if you have a reserve division, they are much weaker. Um, the, the troops tend to be slightly older than in the regular ones. Even though, even in the regular ones, you have about half of the troops um, are not regulars, but are people that had served with the colors and probably within the last one or two years had finished their military service and then are brought back. So these people are still relatively fresh. They're not uh, 100% like a British regular, for example, but they still know their stuff. They still know what they're doing. And they just need, if at all, a quick refresher course. And then they're sent to the front line. You can see how this is played out for example, in the officer corps, about 90% of the officers of the German army in the First World War are reserve officers. So the number of regular officers is actually quite small. And most of them, particularly the junior ones, die in the battles of 1914 and 15. So it's really, really the reserve officer corps that keeps the army going. Much the same way as the, the Reserve Officer Corps keeps the, the British Army going, certainly in early 15. But Absolutely. Of, yeah. of course, those, those Reserve Officers in the British Army really pay an appalling price. And um, you know, one of the great problems the British Army has by 16 is it just doesn't have experienced officers. The, the, the Army's been diluted. And that sort of brings me on to a question about the, the battles of 19, 1915, which, as you said, are go appallingly for the Allies, that the Germans do hold the line here. You mentioned that the 1950 is also putting the German army under strain. And what's the, the, the German impression of how they've done in 1915? Because certainly my impression from a, largely a British perspective, an Allied perspective, is 1915 is just the worst possible year for the Allies, defeated on every single front. But even in the Allied camp, there is a certain sense that, well, the Central Powers have won lots of battles, and they're obviously putting us under a lot of pressure. But apart from conquering Serbia in 1915, they haven't converted this into anything strategically key. And so what, what's the feeling of the German army about its experience in 1915? It must be happy with its its battlefield performance, but is it envisaging problems by the end of 15? Does it have a plan to, to win the war? I think you've hit the uh, the nail on the head there. So they're very happy with the operational performance, uh, but strategically, they're not really achieving anything. And you, we shouldn't forget that Germany, of course, is fighting a two-front war. Um, I know we're concentrating very much on the Western Front here in this podcast, but maybe quickly, perhaps, looking to the other side and looking to the East, because this is where things are happening in 1915. So in the German camp, you always have this debate between what's called the Westerners and the Easterners. So where can you win the war? Is it in the West or is it in the East? In 1914, very clearly, they uh, they attack in the West because they think this is where we can win the war. This is where we have to attack. In 1915, it's very different. So they're holding on the West front. The only attack that comes in is the second Ypres, the famous gas attack. But even that is just a very, very small one that wasn't really designed to break through the Allied defences and win the war on the Western Front. And where you then have the big offensive is, of course, in the East. You already mentioned Serbia. Um, and of course, the really big one is the, the German-Austria-Hungarian attack at Golicitano. So the breakthrough, the Russian lines, which more or less defeats, I wouldn't say destroy, but really defeats the Russian army in what is modern-day Poland and pushes the Russians back. And vast, vast territories of that particular area are then occupied, liberated, whatever you want to call it. However, they still can't achieve strategic success because they've pushed the Russians back, but the Russian army withdraws. So it's still there as a fighting power. So from a pure operational point of view, a pure military point of view, yes, they can be very happy with the performance in 1915, but from a strategic point and grand strategic point, the situation hasn't really changed. If anything, it probably has become worse because in 1915 also Italy enters the war, uh, another front that, uh, that needs mentioning at some point. It's interesting when you think of 1915, and, and if we look at it from a, an Allied perspective for a moment as well, despite it being an incredibly brutal year, of course, you've got the famous Chantilly Conference in November of that year, where the Allies are starting to look really opportunities for 1916. And of course, 
eventually it's going to lead us to the Somme and various other large scale actions. It, it's also interesting as well, and I'd be, I'm intrigued to know about the German mindset here with regards to this decision, because of course a two front war is going to be straining the German resources to the max. And of course, it's it's an, going to be really from 1916 onwards an ever depleting resource. But what's the general logic? And I know most of us know the, the story of Verdun in very broad terms. What is the general logic behind the assault on Verdun? We often hear this phrase, to a retrospective phrase, uh, phrase if I believe correctly, uh, to bleed the French army white. Is that the real objective of Verdun at that point of the war? Well, I was asked to keep my contributions relatively short, but now I need a minute or two to, to go into this. Uh, the short answer is no, it's not to bleed the French army white. You're absolutely right. The first time that this term is mentioned is in Falkenhayn, who's at that stage the uh, the commander of the German forces. Uh, he writes about this in his memoirs, published in 1919. And he says uh, in the December of 1915, he had a meeting with the Kaiser, the famous Christmas memorandum, in which he develops this plan and says, we're going to take at Verdun, we're going to bleed the French army white. That's the idea. However, there are no accounts and records of a meeting with the Kaiser. There is no Christmas memorandum. It doesn't exist, nowhere to be found in the sources. And when you look at what actually happens at Verdun, it's a very complex and difficult story. So Falkenhayn was a very clever man. Um, he was very highly educated, spoke many languages, had served in China. So he really knows how to do these things. Perhaps he was a bit too clever. And that you can see being played out in his war plan. So Falkenhayn is a Westerner. He says the war can only be won in the West. He's also, by the way, the man who said in late 1914, Germany can't win any more military. So there's a bit of a contradiction here. Uh, but what do you do? You can't just, well, throw the ends up and say, okay, we surrender. You're not going to do that. So what he really does, and we know this now because uh, sources have become available in the 1990s. He had been kept in the East German archives and no one had access to that. Because even after the First World War, when they were writing the official history, der Weltkrieg, of the German army, people are confused and people say, what was going on? What was the idea behind this? By that stage, Falkenhayn is dead, but they go around and interview lots of senior officers. And the bottom line is that Falkenhayn attacked at Verdun. When you look at the numbers, very limited numbers, very low in infantry, very heavy on artillery. And the idea was not to, uh, to bleed the French army wide, but to attack the French there, which could have two effects. The first effect was that the French would feel that they would have to defend it and feed forces in. Uh, you could then defeat these and then attack somewhere else. Or the real plan actually was, according to these interviews that were conducted after the war, that the Germans would attack at Verdun. The French and the British, in particular the British, would panic. The British would launch a premature counterattack somewhere in the Somme area, which the Germans, because the Germans thought that operationally they were better, and now all British listeners, please close your ears. The Germans thought from 1914 all the way to 1918 that the French army was far better at fighting, particularly at the operational level, than the British army. So they see the British army very much as the junior partner, both in capability and ability. So they want the British to attack prematurely. They would then defeat this attack and would then counterattack and then drive the British into the sea. That is the idea, because to, uh, to Falkenhayn, Britain is the main enemy. He says, we can deal with the French. We've done it before, 1870, 71. Good German tradition to, to fight against France. Britain is a bit difficult and it's a bit different. So that's the whole idea. And the plan really falls to pieces because it's mainly the French. Joffre says, no, no, we can hold it. Well done. Even if they do break through, well, look at this. There is no strategic objective. You might say, I would argue, again, Spence and Dan, you know that better than I do, from the Allied side, we look at the Somme. What's the strategic objective? It's a bit like this. And uh, the British are relatively keen to launch this offensive. Haig, again, Spencer, you know much more about this than I do, but it's the French who are holding them back. And because that doesn't really happen, the German plan then basically falters and collapses. And what you then have, because you have the Chantilly Conference and you have these the coordinated attacks, you have, for example, the Brusilov Offensive in the East, which leads to the collapse of the Austro-Hungarian army. And the Germans need to transfer quite a lot of troops. So they've got about 20 to 25 divisions in the reserve, which they want to use for this counterattack. They have to transfer quite a few of those, 12 to 15, to the Eastern Front. So this operation reserves just basically melts like snow in the sun. They simply don't have these forces to do that. But that's the original plan. So it's an indirect approach, you might say. Attack the French to then defeat the British. Once the British have been driven into the sea, 
then turn around, and then you only have to deal with one major enemy, and that's the French. And that can be done. That's the thinking behind it. And that's really interesting to hear the, the strategic side of this, because you, as you say, the, the burden is a more complex strategic option than commonly perceived. It's not nihilistic. It does have some strategic underpinning behind it. But it, in a way, I suppose, the, the central powers in 1916 are they had the strategic initiative ripped away from them because the Allies are, are launching, and we've discussed this on the podcast before, the general offensive of offensives more or less at the same time throughout the summer. And so... Something that, that strikes me is from the, the Verdun vision, if you will, the Germans almost end up with the worst of both possible worlds. They they do ultimately draw a British counterattack that was going to happen anyway as part of the general offensive. The counterattack, as bloody and ghastly as that first day is, it keeps going that the British don't recoil. They keep attacking and um, you keep putting the Germans under pressure. And the Germans are also knee-deep in Verdun as well. And so... That the worst of both worlds seem to come from this. You 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 end up fighting two really massive battles on on the Western Front at the same time. But what's striking to me, looking at this through the lens of a, of, of the British perspective, and what was striking to the British as well, certainly in the aftermath of this, is the Germans do it. Although certainly by September 1916, and, and correct me if I'm wrong on this, Matthias, but I understand the Germans are are feeling the strain by September 16, especially on the Somme. Uh, period where the, the Allies are a bit more ascendant on that battlefield. Germans are under a tremendous strain across the Western Front. They're, of course, they change Falkenhayn, they, they change the bowler. I believe he ends up in the Ottoman Empire a little bit later. The, the situation's really, really severe. They're under huge pressure. And yet, and yet they, the, the line more or less holds. For all the effort the Allies throw in at the Somme, it, the line goes forward five miles at the cost of staggering numbers of British and French casualties. And so that is this, I was going to say, pitch a question to you. First of all, do you think that the whole Verdun concept was ultimately a strategic folly? But secondly, do we have a situation where perhaps the Germans have made a strategic error, but at the same time redeemed it, if you will, or, or prevented themselves from really feeling the consequences because the army's so good and it fights so hard? Well, there's a lot to it. Well, first of all, when you look at Falkenhayn and the Verdun plan, of course, he got a lot of flack for it afterwards. And as you said, he's then sacked because of the Verdun, which you might say disaster. Uh, he's then sent to Romania, where he is the, the head behind the, the very, very quick defeat of Romania. So operationally, you can see he's actually really, really good. So as I said earlier, maybe he's a bit too clever for himself and, and for the army. So that's that's a bit of a downside. And yes, the Germans do suffer massive casualties. That's the big, big problem. Um, and they do realize that they can't do this again. So the whole question about, I know you talked about that in, a, in another podcast, so who won the Battle of the Somme? It is obvious and clear that Germans are really suffering as well when it comes to the Somme. And they realize they can't do this again. So Falkenhayn is out. In come Hindenburg and Ludendorff, so the great heroes from the Eastern Front, and they take over. And the first thing, one of the first things that they do is they look at the situation in the West and say, well, the fighting here is so fundamentally different from what we've seen in the East. It's much more mobile and flexible. It's much more about the battle of material. So we need to change things and how we do things. And as a consequence of that, in December 1916, they issue uh, new guidelines Grundsätze für die Führung des Stellungskriegs im Abwehrkampf. If you can, if you repeat that, I'll buy you a beer. Um, <laughs> and uh, in that, they make very, very clear, they say, well, the way we fought on the Somme, and also then in the later stages, the defensive battles at Verdun, is breaking the neck of the German army. And it's all about material, not manpower. So they actually release hundreds of thousands of soldiers from the front line to send them back into the factories to make sure that uh, you have more machine guns, more guns and what have you, because they see that is the way forward. Germany at that stage is beginning to run out of manpower and they realize it's only material that they can use to substitute for this. And of course, the other big problem that they have is again, the great strategic idea, because the Germans and the Austrians, as the two main powers in the central powers, they don't even really talk to each other. You can still see that in 1916. So the Austrians want to have what they call a Strafexpedition, punitive expedition, they call it. That's the name of their operation against Italy. 
And the Germans say, that's, that's stupid. Italy isn't important. Support us on the Western Front. No, we're not doing this. And it's only after the complete disaster of the Brussels of Offensive that you then have some sort of joint high command, which is very much controlled by the Germans, which, of course, does not go down well in the Austrian uh, camp. And so they're trying to outmaneuver this particular high command. And you can see, so from a strategic point of view, nothing has really improved. Well, it's a very interesting perspective that you bring up there. And I think particularly with this idea of replacing uh, flesh with steel on the Western Front to try and, if you like, uh, shore up what is what is clearly a, a difficult situation with a, with a kind of mounting pressure. Now, if we combine that with what happens a couple of months later with the famous withdrawal to the Hindenburg line, in effect, shortening the line, taking up a far more defensive posture, is this does this for you, Matthias, mark a real shift in the change in German attitude from what has perhaps previously been majority defensive action with a couple of major exceptions, is this now going to be an entirely defensive war right through until March of 1918? It's pretty much this, absolutely. And again, you need to understand who is in charge now. So the people who are in charge in 19, late 1916, 1917, 18, these are Hindenburg and Ludendorff. They come from the Eastern Front. So they're Easterners. So they think the war can actually be won on the Eastern Front. Once you've, you've knocked out Russia, then you can see what happens on the Western Front. No real plans exist for this, but that's exactly that. So before that, Falkenhayn, the Westerner, says, no, no, we need to keep attacking in the West. This is where we can win the war. Only there we can win the war. So the bigger the defensive works are, the worse it is for morale because the offensive spirit will go away. So we shouldn't have that. These guys are very, very different. And again, combine that with this whole idea that you're running out of manpower, so have very, very well-established, deep defensive lines, let the enemy attack, and then you can inflict a very, very heavy blood toll on the enemy. It also goes hand in hand with the changes in German doctrine, because in 1917, the Germans changed their defensive doctrine, which goes to this, this defense in depth, where you move away from trenches and you just have dugouts and um, and individual soldiers fighting at machine gun position and all these things. But so you're moving away from the whole idea of having trenches, because again, trenches inflict casualties, because the enemy, know they know exactly where the trenches are. So it goes hand in hand. But yes, you're absolutely right. So you've got a very big strategic shift. And you might say, for the first time, really, this whole debate between the Westerners and the Easterners is really decided and, and cemented in concrete, you might say, because you've got the, I would call the Siegfried Linie, the Hindenburg Line, um, whatever you want to call it. But that's that's the embodiment of that thinking. Absolutely right. I'm glad you brought up steel and concrete, because we discussed this previously on the, the podcast that the, the First World War is this constant learning race that both armies are, or both sides are competing with each other for innovation, for new methods, for new tactics to breach the defences. And just as one side appears dominant, here comes a new method that's going to change it. And we see this a lot in 1916, the Allies getting much more sophisticated in their assaults, especially the British. You've got tanks are being introduced now. You've got a real battle between British and German artillery for technical innovation. And certainly at the end of 1916, I think both the British and the French are quite confident, militarily, not politically, it has to be said, the politicians are not very happy about the situation. But the militaries, there's a sort of quiet confidence to say, okay, well, the Somme was a, a bloodbath, but we know we've been dealt a huge blow to the Germans to... And we think we can do it again. And the Allied plans at the end of 1916 are to renew the Battle of the Somme. Um, Henry Wilson, who goes on to be the chief of the Imperial General Staff of Britain, memorably says the secret to, to winning the war is, in his words, to fight two battles of the Somme at once. And so they're quite happy about this. And I, I've seen the phrase used in, in the German military, we want to avoid Somme fighting, that, that style of battle we can't have anymore. So the Allies seem to have a method for, for breaching the defensive lines of 1915 and 16. And then the Germans moved to this new system, which we've discussed a little bit on the podcast, especially in relation to the defences at Ypres. But this, I think, is a really important point, that they, one, that the Germans have come up with this idea, and secondly, that they can do it, that they can actually construct all these defences, move to this new system. How important is this change seen within the German army? Because it's a quite a radical departure from how they've been fighting on the Western Front up to this point. It is it is quite radical because, as you've already said, and as we've discussed, it really shows that you're now fighting a long defensive war. And that is very, very clear. And the German army, like all the other armies at the time, had very much as its ethos, an offensive spirit. 
But he might say, this is now taken away. And the way it's explained to the army is, well, here you just have to hold the front line. So you're basically the shield, whereas the sword is now, well, uh, comes down on the Eastern Front and we need to knock out the guys on the Eastern Front. So it's always, you always have to see these two fronts together. Uh, from the German case or the German point of view, you can't just talk about the Western Front. You always need to bring in, in particular, the Eastern Front as well. And this is how it's actually even explained to people in the trenches, in these positions, in these dugouts. This is what we need to do. So grind your teeth, hold out. The decision is being fought out in the East. Once that's done, we can then uh, go for the decision in the West. And this is what they believe is the best thing. And this is what they push through. And together with that, not only do they have all these this concrete and the positions and the dugouts, they also completely change the way they fight. We've already briefly addressed it. It's the defense in depth, which is designed to inflict heavy casualties, which is also designed to avoid casualties on your own side. And again, it's very interesting when you look at why the Germans come up with this and how they implement this. This is all to do with mission command. So we always have this idea that the German army in both world wars is this, this these, these corporals goose stepping up and down, shouting orders and people just marching forward. Far from it. The German army, both in World War I and World War II, is what you might call a thinking army. I would always say, having gone through a conscript system myself, conscript armies are on the whole the more intelligent armies because you get clever people in. It's also an army that learns from the bottom up. So you get all these ideas and they're pushed up to through the chain of command. They're very receptive to learning. That's then uh, put into official doctrine and pushed down again. And if you don't have mission command, you can't really conduct this defense in depth. And that's, uh, as far as I understand, again, Spencer, you might correct me, is one of the big problems that the British face when they're then hit by the German offensive, because they try to imitate this, but it's not really working. So again, there are lots of different factors here that, that come into play. And if you look at mission command, again, you could make the whole thing, the whole package a bit bigger. This is not only about military training. This is also about society, how society works. And again, this whole idea that Germany consisted of lots of reserve lieutenants, lieutenants goose stepping up and down is completely wrong. There are lots of accounts from even before the war where there are lots of troubles and tensions between the wider public and the military. So there's a lot of that going on as well. So it is a relatively highly educated society. And with that, you can do things like this. I, I find this uh, metaphor that you used there, uh, Matthias, the, the sword and shield, really excellent. Of course, famously used uh, to describe the Normandy campaign as well. But the, the the concept, I think, is particularly fascinating. And the the way that I see it, at least from, from my way of thinking, is, that, of course, the shield that is the Western Front is there to absorb these blows. Although what it's hoping is that as it's absorbing these blows, that shield is not getting chipped away more than can be managed, little by little. And, of course, we do see these sustained attacks. We see, of course, a major French attack in the early part of 1917. We see the Battle of Arras from a British perspective, which includes Vimy Ridge. And then later on, we're going to see Messines, which I think we can maybe come back to very briefly. What really intrigues me, though, is, of course, because we need to think a little bit more away from the Western Front as well when, when describing what goes on, is what happens between the sword and the shield at that point, the area in the middle, because there, there are two things that I'd just love to get your opinion on. The first uh, we've spoken about fairly recently, which is the uh, re-establishment of unrestricted submarine warfare, and the second is now starting to feel the pinch of Allied naval blockades. Now, my question about these, are these two things absolutely undermining the concept of sword and shield on the fighting fronts, or is that not quite taking hold enough at this point? It's not really undermining it. So when you look at the whole idea of unrestricted U-word warfare, so the first time this idea comes really up is when Falkenhayn comes up with the plans for Verdun. So we already talked about this whole idea, what he wants to achieve. But he says it's very difficult to directly attack the British. So the only way you can do this is by having U-boat warfare, because they bring together an awful lot of very, very clever statisticians and uh, and scientists, and they throw around some some figures and sums and come to the conclusion that, yes, well, we can starve Britain out and Britain will have to surrender. As we know, it's not going to happen. And he says the naval arm, so to speak, goes hand in hand with the land arm. So it's the first time that in German thinking that actually happens, because before that, the Navy is there, but doesn't really play a role. It's more a prestige object. And it's also an internal project because it's a German Navy. So it's not a Prussian Navy, Bavarian Navy, it's the German Navy. It's the embodiment of the new United Germany. That's why, for political reasons, it's very, very important. And Feigenheim is the first one who brings these two together. 
So it goes hand in hand, you might say. And he says, well, you need to take the war to Britain. Britain needs to feel the pinch as well. And the only way you can do that is by doing this. And also, of course, the, the positive effect of that would be if you can not only starve Britain out, but also make sure that uh, material can't be sent, for example, from America to Britain or from Britain to France. That, of course, helps the, the army as well fighting in France because they simply don't have engaged these, these men, this material, because that all went down in the channel. That's another idea. The big problem, of course, that you have is the strategic idea behind that, or strategic consequences, I should say, which, of course, lead to the entry of the US in the war. And that really, really means that Germany has lost. The Germans don't really understand that. It's a bit like in World War II. Uh, but that is, of course, I would argue, the big, big turning point of the First World War. And when you look at what goes on in Germany, and also Austria, actually, Austria is suffering far more than Germany under the blockade. It's quite often taken out of the equation. We don't really look at this. It's having a massive effect. Um, so Germany depends very largely on food imports. Um, most of these are cut. Uh, there's a bit coming through, through Sweden, and in particular the Netherlands as a neutral country. But on the whole, the Germans are really suffering. And it's the civilian population, which leans, for example, to the famous turn of winter of 1916. Um, and uh, Melanie Nourishment. There are no one's really quite sure, but the estimates go to somewhere in the region of about a million to two million people who die in Germany because of malnutrition. And Austria, as I said, is hit even worse because they relied on uh, on corn coming in from the east, and that's all being cut off. And of course, it also has an impact on the the war machine, the war machinery, because you don't get the raw materials anymore. And when you when you Jump forward, for example, to 1918. One of the big problems that the Germans have when they're trying to bring reinforcements forward as they're attacking again in, in, in the West in March 1918 is they simply don't have enough lorries, they don't have enough petrol, they don't have any rubber for the wheels. So that has a massive impact as well. Artillery, the same thing. So the German barrels wear out, just like all barrels do, but the Germans can't really replace them. And that's, that, of course, has a massive impact on what the Germans can achieve and what the Germans can do. It also then means you have a lot of unrest in Germany. So you've got massive strikes, for example, 1916 and 1917. Hundreds of thousands of people go on strike, in particular the ammunition workers. And that, of course, sends shockwaves through, through Germany. Oh, my God, if they are on strike, how can we win this? How can we continue the fight? So all sorts of implications and impacts. And in a nutshell, the blockade worked really, really well. I would say... To be perfectly honest, it was a pretty nasty thing because it killed about a million to two, no one's really quite sure, civilians, but it did achieve its aim. Interesting points, especially regarding the, the war effectively being lost at a strategic level once the Americans enter the war, which of course they're brought into the war by Germany's own strategic decision making. And I see this, this theme that keeps cropping up that you later right at the start, the Germans try and solve strategic problems purely through military solutions. There's not a lot of crafty diplomacy underpinning any of this. And uh, bringing the Americans in is, of course, a, a huge problem. And it's one that we've, we've discussed a lot. We've just finished, of course, a, a long series within the series about the Doughboys. And there's a particular metaphor, Dan, you like to use, which always sticks with me that once America has declared war, it's as if a stopwatch appears somewhere and starts counting down. And once that stopwatch runs out of time, there's going to be so many Americans on the Western Front that there's just not going to be a prospect that, that Germany can overcome this. And, and so I think that the German army, it seems to me, Matthias, gets stuck in this quite deadly position where defensively in 1917, it's well absorbed a lot of the lessons of uh, from 1916, it's absorbed the lessons of the Somme. We see so much of this at the um, Third Eep or Passchendaele campaign that the Germans absorb everything that the British can throw at them. And my God, that the British really do throw everything at those ridges. German line holds. I believe Ludendorff refers to it as Germany's greatest defensive victory of the war. And uh, given the consequences, if Eep had been or the ridges had been taken, you can see why he would say that. And yet, all this tremendous sacrifice, tremendous defensive fighting on the Western Front, in some ways, it's it's for naught because the Americans are coming and they're bringing this huge body of manpower. And so this is going to prompt Germany to to take the biggest gamble probably since 1914 and, and, try, and try and win the war in one fell swoop. Can you talk a little bit about the, the strategic underpinning about what Ludendorff hopes to achieve with this offensive and whether you think it's got any even vague prospects of success. 
Well, again, let's let's widen the angle a little bit and very, very briefly only look at the Eastern Front because in 1917, Russia is defeated and Germany is victorious together with the Austrians on the Eastern Front. And of course, that opens new, new ideas, new doors. And you look at the map and as you already said, Ludendorff and the Germans know the Americans are arriving. Um, if you want to do something, if you want to bring the war to a victorious end, and that's always the big idea of victorious, they're not thinking about some sort of negotiated peace at the time, because they said, we've done it in the East. So if we've done it in the East, now we're down to one front, we can probably do that. But it has to happen quickly. The longer you wait, the weaker the Germans get, and the stronger the Allies get, mainly because of the Americans. So Ludendorff comes up with this plan of the March Offensive, the Michael Offensive. And when you look at it, uh, three big armies that are launched. And again, you might say the idea is a little bit bit more direct, but a little bit like Verdun again, because the main idea really is to drive the British into the sea. The Germans think once you've achieved this, you can then turn around and defeat the French, open bracket. Now you also have to deal with the Americans, but the Germans say at this stage, they're not particularly battle-hardened, they're not really quite good at fighting, so we can probably deal with them now, but it has to happen now. And this is why they launched the offensive in March. So they look at different options. For example, we talked about Ypres a little bit. They also look at an attack in, in Ypres, but they say, well, the terrain isn't quite right, particularly if we attack too early, the ground's still too soft, too boggy, so we can't attack there. That's why they chose the area that they finally attack, in essence, going over the Somme battlefield and a bit further to, to the south as well. So it's a huge gamble. But as one of the, uh, the German generals after the war wrote, what else could we have done? The alternative would have been that you either surrender, that's not on the card, because actually at that stage, it looks, the strategic situation is probably the most favorable one from a pure military point of view uh, it's ever been in the war, because Russia is out. In the long term, you will get lots of uh, resources. You will get an awful lot of um, of food uh, from, from the east. So the British blockade is being outmaneuvered. So that all works in the Germans' favor. The alternative, which some people also suggest, was, well, let's stay put. Let's just stay in the in the Siegfried line. Let's, let's, um, uh, let's continue the defensive battle here. We just continue to fight here. We inflict casualties. They know that the French and also the British are quite war-weary at that stage. They say the Americans are a bit different. They don't really have a view on America. One of the big problems that you find, the German understanding of America has always been very weak. It's uh, to a large degree, to say quite flippantly, based on, on the novels by a German writer, Karl May, who wrote about Indians and, uh, and cowboys and what have you. That's pretty much the view that most people have. So they don't really have an understanding, but they say this is where we need to strike. That's the last and only chance, and that's why they go for it. So just following on from that, Matthias, and going back to something that you raised earlier, which I thought was quite interesting, of course, it, the spring offensive also comes at a really inconvenient time for the Allies, British internal reshuffles within their divisions. They're also trying to get to grips with uh, effectively adopting the, the famous defence in depth, depth, the Lossberg system, and not doing a very good job of it, we might add, by fatally overweighting their front lines, much of which we're going to see the result of on the 21st of March, 1918. And so... It, the Western Front, at least to Allied eyes, really does get shook to its core in those opening opening days of the assault. And we discussed this when we previously tackled this subject. Amiens frequently comes up as a as a real key opportunity and possibility. But is the, is it true that there's a there's a lack of direction really beyond those opening days as far as German strategy is concerned in terms of what are we actually trying to achieve and how is it going to be applied? to the men fighting on the battlefield. Is, it, is this a missed opportunity in those 21st to say 30th of March, 1918? Well, there is a bit of a missed opportunity. And when you look at what Hindenburg and particularly Ludendorff want to achieve, one of the last briefings before the operations actually started, so Ludendorff presents the plan and Crown Prince Ruprecht of Bavaria, who's normally seen as one of the, the best military leaders in the German army at that particular time, he asks, okay, but what are we doing here? Where is the strategic aim? What, what's the point of this operation? And Ludendorff just says, we're going to punch a hole into their lines and for the rest we shall see. That's how we did it in Russia. So Ludendorff says, whereas most other offensives up to that stage, whether they were German and or, or also allied, have this great strategic idea and strategic vision. But because they can't fight their way through the defensive system, they fall very, very, very quickly. 
And he says we need to do it the other way around. So we need to concentrate on the tactical victory first, so the break in, the breakthrough, and then the exploitation, and then see where this takes us. And this is exactly what happens, because when you look at the way the, the March offensive then basically plays out, so you've got three armies, and the idea was that the center army was to be the main army, and then push to the west, and then to the northwest, to basically drive the British into the sea. The southern part of the operation is actually more successful. So they reinforce success and push into this area. And it's particularly the French again, then looking at this and thinking, well, okay, this is brilliant for us because there is no strategic aim here. They can seize as much territory as they want. They're not going to win the war because there's nothing here. And that is the big, big problem. And Amiens is an interesting one because I know that comes up time and again, particularly when you talk to, to British historians and, and British people on the whole, that this was really the missed opportunity. After the war, a number of German generals are asked about this, and they all say, well, Amiens is completely irrelevant. Because even if you, if you seize Amiens, well, just look at the geography, look at the ports where the ports are, Britain could have switched the supply lines very, very quickly. And this is why Amiens is not even mentioned in the German operational plan. Right or wrong, I'm not quite sure, but a very different view. Uh, that's really interesting because certainly the British are really, really, really worried that Amiens is going to fall. Yeah. And the you know, Hague orders a, a, a staff yeah. exercise effectively quickly draw up what are we going to do if, if we lose access uh, to the marshalling yards here. And the, the general British impression, and this also comes out very strongly in the, the post war official history, is my God, thank God yeah. the Germans didn't perceive the value of this because although the, the plan is ultimately to fall back towards the ports, shorten the, the logistic lines, that is going to represent such a huge dislocation of the British logistics system, which one of the advantages of the Western Front, because it doesn't move very much, you can really organise your logistics. You don't have to worry too much about moving around for better or for worse. But then losing your central point in the south, um, Amiens, is disastrous. And even worse would be losing Hasbrook in the north, which the, the British describe as the jugular of their army. If that's cut, the, the army will bleed to death. So in, in a way, interesting that the Germans don't, don't really see a lot of value in this and say, well, the British will just react to it. The British would have reacted to it, but my God, that's a bit like saying, well, you know, you're, you're traveling down a road at 100 miles an hour and there's a, a, you know, something coming directly at you. You'll react to it, it'll be okay. <laughs> yeah. You might, but my God, it's going to be hair raising and you're going to put yourself in great danger. So really, really sort of interesting aspect here. But one thing that, that I think is, is striking too is the, the British and the French are really shocked by the violence of the German assaults as well. And that probably lends weight to it. You know, my God, if the Germans had just gone a bit further and taken Amiens or, or broken through at Hasbrook, we'd be, we'd be in real trouble. But I think you've got a bit more to say. I saw that it's definitely saw you motion in that direction. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely right. Um, I think it's also a good embodiment of the different philosophies of war. And again, you need to go back to this whole idea about German fighting and uh, this, the geostrategic situation surrounded by enemies. You really need to be able to, to knock out the enemy very, very quickly. And that means traditionally in the German sense, logistics isn't something you really pay an awful lot of attention to. It's all about the teeth arm because you need to go into battle. You need to defeat the enemy as quickly as possible and then see what happens. If you want to fight a long game in which material logistics is ever more important, uh, you have lost anyway. Of course, by that stage, the First World War is very much a war of material. But when the Germans are on the offensive again, they go back to the original mindset. It's all about defeating the enemy armies. It's about storming forward. It's about inflicting casualties very, very quickly and heavily. And do that as fast as you can, because the moment you stop somewhere, it's over. So in those days, even today, Logistics is not really something that a lot of people would really go into if you want to have a very, very good military career. It's just stuff that happens. It's the boring bits. What you want to do is have a big map and then you draw big, big, big blue arrows and then say, we go west or east or north or what have you. So the operation section, that's the sexy bit. That's what everybody wants to do. And I think the British and the, and the French have always fought a slightly different war because they know once you mobilize the empires, it's all about sustainment. It's all about logistics. And perhaps this is the embodiment here of these two different philosophies. There's a, um, a very interesting point to make there in terms of how those uh, those philosophies, uh, I, I think, shift actually as the war goes on. Because, of course, we need to, as we get towards the end of this episode, we need to consider how the tide also shifts on the Western Front and how we see the uh, effectively the pushback, which is going to ultimately end on the 11th of November 1918. So once the Germans have reached their kind of high tide mark, um, we've argued recently whether whether the turning point, the the start of the, uh, of the pushback is going to be Second Battle of the Marne or whether it's going to be 
the Battle of Amiens in August. Uh, usually by British eyes, we claim it's Amiens. I think probably more realistically, it's probably Second Marne. But by this point, we're now starting to see Germans obviously struggling, having lost huge numbers of casualties in the uh, in in this famous push, and also Allied numbers, in particular Allied materiel, now coming out and really starting to get very heavy on the Western Front. Now, what's the German mindset as the hundred days or the hundred and seventeen days, depending which number you take, kicks off? Is it is it something of simply just trying to hold and find a negotiated peace? Is there any realistic prospect in your mind of anything other than just a delaying action until the war inevitably comes to an end? I think this is very much it. You already mentioned all the the key factors and aspects here. So casualties. So on the first day of the offensive, the Germans lose over eighty thousand men. So that's more than the British on the, the first day of the Somme. And the, the casualty numbers are simply staggering. And the Germans can't replace them. That, of course, is the big, big problem. The Allies have the Americans coming in, the Germans don't. What you then have is the Germans uh, pretty much in, in open territory, no longer in these very well-defended positions. So when they're then hit by the counteroffensive, it's relatively easy to, to unlock the German position. So here's some, some military reasons. Uh, you also have, of course, psychological reasons. So the Germans had been told that this is the last push. This is the push that brings the war to an end. And after that, Germany will be victorious. So one last push. um, Let's all get together behind this. And then we've won the war. And suddenly they realize, well, the war isn't won. And from that moment onwards, whether it's in the military and also the political cycles, you see that, well, you know what? This is not going well, is it? And uh, from that moment onwards, it's just, as you say, it's this delaying action not quite sure what can be achieved, what can be done. They're going back to this idea of if we keep fighting, we can then inflict more casualties and can come to some sort of negotiated peace. Let's not forget at that stage, the Germans are still in Belgium. They're still in France. They're not fighting on German soil. There is this idea of going all the way back to the River Rhine and having a defensive line. And I know the Allies are quite worried about this, because I think that would be very difficult to unlock this position there. So they're doing this, but from that point onwards, it's even more than before. It's just a desperate muddling through, I would say. Not ready yet to surrender. They still think we're strong enough to keep fighting, but they know they're not going to come out of, the, out of this victorious. I've read various biographies of Ludendorff that he's he's sort of got one big ambition, try and hold the Allies around the Hindenburg line, the, 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 the last bastion, if you will, in central France. And fight on to the winter and the allies will be frozen stiff and some sort something will happen some sort of negotiated deal might come out perhaps based on Woodrow Wilson's 14 points obviously it doesn't work the Hindenburg line's breached the allies continue to advance but one thing that's it's striking and it's something that we've revisited a lot when we were discussing the doughboys is even though by October 1918 the German army in the west is really on its last legs you've got large scale surrenders equipment wearing out barrel wear on the artillery, all kinds of problems. There's still, I I won't even say pockets, because I think that that implies a very small number, but there's still a significant amount of the German army that fights very hard, even though it must be clear the war is lost. And what's motivating this determination? Is it sheer bloody-minded professionalism? Is it still a hope that that something might be salvaged from the war, or is it something else? Well, this really is a difficult thing and lots of people and generations of historians have argued over this and uh, tried to to unpack this whole thing. What I think it is, is first of all, it's the professionalism that you mentioned. You're an army, you you just don't surrender, you don't do this, particularly if you're still in enemy territory. Why would you? You keep on fighting. I think that's very important. Uh, Another fact that is very important by 1918 is you've gone through four years of very, very heavy fighting, hundreds of thousands of millions of casualties. Just in inverted commas, throwing all this away and saying, you know what, okay, we've lost, is nothing that you can sell to the army or also the home front. So the home front, despite all these, these strikes that you have, holds out till, um, till November 1918. Only then you've got the revolutions in Germany. So there is still this idea that, yes, we're probably not going to win. But again, coming back to this quote I, I said, I mentioned earlier, what else could we have done? You just keep on fighting, hoping for the best. I think that is pretty much it. 
that brings us, I think, to to an interesting general concept here to kind of round this, to almost to bring it back to the very start of the podcast here. And uh, the, the concept that's often put forward really, and, and you made the, the point much earlier, Matthias, when we were talking about the ultimate failure of the Schlieffen Plan and the, uh, the proclamation that the war was lost at that point. I wonder if we look at this, this concept of a, of a two-front war, and perhaps that's not even correct, maybe we should look at it as a three-front war or even a four-front war, depending on which parameters you take. Was it inevitable in your mind, really, that once that very first shock of 1914, the Schlieffen Plan failing, doesn't come to pass, is it inevitable that Germany is going to lose this war? Again, one of the one of the big questions, the hundred thousand dollar question here. My personal view is no. I think that the war was decided in 1917, and that is with the entry of the US. And when you look at the chronology here, so Germany declares unrestricted U-boat warfare, which brings the US into, into the war in April 1917. Shortly after that, you have the revolutions in Russia. If the Germans had foreseen that, which of course they didn't, and hadn't declared unrestricted U-boat warfare, the US hadn't come into the war, or great big what-ifs, so lots of interesting what-ifs books to be written about this. Um, they then defeat the Russians on the Eastern Front, then turn to the West, and then you're facing the French and the British armies who are also weakened, um, who are a bit uh, weary of the war. The societies are, I wouldn't say collapsing, but you've got the same issues and problems that you find uh, that you find in, in Germany at the time. I think the outcome could have been very, very different. So I personally think that it's this, the summer or the, the, the spring of 1917, which really eventually turns the table. I know we've got a, a small but very dedicated group of listeners who are always asking us to do more about the war at sea, which is something that always interests me. Yeah. Um, I feel you've set us up really neatly there for saying, <laughs> is the turning point there for the Battle of Jutland and the, the decision made by the German fleet, look, we can't beat the, the British fleet head on. We're going to have to try and do something else. Topic for a, for a future discussion. Maybe we'll have you back on, Matthias, to discuss German <laughs> naval strategy in the First World War. But... Interesting point that, that the 1917 is is the year when the Germ Germany strategically is in it puts itself in a a really difficult and unwinnable position. Uh, and one thing, just I'd like to sort of uh, appreciate where uh, we've kept you for a long time. I'd like to ask is what do the Germans think after the war? What does the German military think about how it's performed? Where does it think the blame lies as it analyzes what's happened in World War One? Well, the straight, straightforward answer to this is that the German army, on the whole, thinks that it was superior to the enemies. It fought better. And again, British listeners, please close your ears. They particularly thought they were better than the British. Um, to the Germans, when you read the after-action reports and, and also the, the analysis of uh, the interwar period, they still see the French as the, the better, the more innovative, the stronger enemy. Um, but of course, what you do find is, well, they lose. So uh, that's, that, that's a fact. But of course, it's very difficult for them to come to terms with it. And of course, this brings in this whole idea of the step in the back, the Dolchstoßlegende, as it's called in German. So the German army is still fighting, is still standing in Belgium, is still fighting in France. And suddenly the revolution breaks out, um, um, run by, so the, the saying goes, by Jews and communists and socialists. And because of that, the Kaiser abdicates, the home front collapses, and this is why you then have to make peace. So the, the slogan was that the army was undefeated in the field. And Ludendorff, for example, he writes a book about all this, and he says, well, if it comes to the next war, um, we need to do it very differently, because what we didn't do well is mobilize society back home. And he says, this is really where the modern war is won. And he calls the book Total War, which um, Der Totale Krieg, normally translated as totalitarian war, which sums it up actually much, much better, because he says all about the home front. So they put the blame very firmly on the home front, which, of course, is, is the easy solution for them. And uh, so by doing that, they can keep a straight face and say, well, you know what, we fought really, really well. Well, that's a, a fascinating way to look at it. And of course, we've, uh, we've discussed this uh, just fairly recently, actually. You know, how much longer would it have taken before that stab in the back idea would have been uh, would have been totally moot by the Allies advancing directly into Germany as Pershing wanted, or would it have been something else that would have uh, that would have eventuated first? But we have to finish somewhere, and uh, we've kept you, as uh, Spence said, for quite a long time now, Matthias. No problem at all. So you are. I can talk. <laughs> <laughs> and. Uh, we certainly, uh, for those of you guys that are just introduced Matthias, maybe missed that first bonus episode we did recently. Of course, Matthias is one of the two hosts 
of our sister podcast, which is World War II, Both Sides of the Wire. It's uh, it's fairly new. It's out there. It's really exciting. Got loads of loads of interest already. Matthias, give us just a just a 30 seconds on, on what people can expect if they come and join World War II, Both Sides of the Wire. What kind of thing do you and Jesse Alexander, the co-host, bring to that? Well, I think there's two things. The first thing is the international side. So Jesse being Canadian, uh, fluent in French. He now lives in Vienna. So he's got a very, very good global view, you might say, of things. And I, of course, come in and uh, mainly talk about the German side or the Axis powers. So you get that's it's in the title, isn't it? Both sides of the wire. So we give uh, due diligence to, to both camps. That's the first thing. And the second thing is that we look at a number of the myths that have evolved around the Second World War. Each and every country, each and every army, each and every society has its own myths. But the moment you start looking at a battle, a campaign, a particular problem from the both sides, you can see that, of course, the truth is always, always very, very different from what you think it is. There's an awful lot of, of gray rather than black and white. And this is it. So we're trying to, to bust some of the myths that are out there. Fantastic. Well, uh, I can highly recommend it, Spencer. I, I know you do as well. It's a really, it's a fascinating look and and something really quite unique in terms of Second World War podcast. There's some great military history out there, but do check it out. Matthias and Jesse's World War II, both sides of the wire, releases every Wednesday. So you can uh, check out that episode on a Wednesday, catch Spencer and I on a Friday, and uh, you've got plenty of historical content to keep you busy throughout the working week. But ladies and gents, that brings us to the end of this episode. Thanks ever so much again for joining us. Special thanks to you, Matthias and Spence. As always, great talking to you. So that's it for this week. Uh, Do come along and join us next time. You've been listening to Not So Quiet on the Western Front, a Battle Guide production. If you've enjoyed this podcast, why not check out the Battle Guide YouTube channel where we regularly release documentaries exploring some of the most famous and extraordinary episodes from throughout military history. If you'd like to support the Battle Guide team to create more content just like this, why not head over to our Patreon, where for the cost of just a cup of coffee, you can get access to full-length virtual battlefield tours, exclusive behind-the-scenes content, decide which subjects we cover in future podcasts and videos, and join a fantastic community of like-minded people. That's all this time. See you again soon. So I'm going to... Oh, <laughs> we've got to work this out. Got it, got it. Matthias, give us give us a name for one of us and we'll work it out. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You, uh, you go ahead, Tom.